Welcome to day two of the ICS Indigenous Virtual Summit, um, Indigenous Cultural Safety Summit, Leaping into Self-Reflection, Creating Ripples in Your ICS Journey. My name is Tristan. I am Northern Tachoni from the Yukon, and I am the ICS Administrative Assistant. We are so grateful to each and every one of you that has set aside time and space to join us today. Whether that be tuning in for a session or for the entire day, we look forward to sharing in this learning experience alongside you. As all of our keynote speakers share their teachings, the ICS team invites each of you to reflect upon what you have learned, as we will periodically be sharing links and corresponding codes to our Slido account in the chat box throughout the day. I'd like to begin by introducing Elder Mahara. Elder Mahara Albright belongs to the Slaywitch Nation. She is an elder, spiritual leader, healer, counselor, and family constellation facilitator, as well as a mother and grandmother. Her training has involved two years intensive on-the-job training at the Nietzsche Institute in Alberta, a training facility for First Nations counselors to learn how to counsel in First Nations treatment centers. This was an elder-led organization, and the facilitators were supervised by a psychologist. Pacific Coast Family Therapy Program in Vancouver, a two-year training program in which students have family systems theory in the first year and a supervised practice in the second year. All the instructors were registered clinical counselors and or university professors. Aside from this, Elder Mahara has taken training in various methods of counseling and relevant areas of study and clinical supervision, including dream interpretation, the intensive journal method, family constellation therapy, introduction to art therapy, therapeutic touch, Reiki at the master level, dream interpretation, and somatic experiencing therapy. Elder Mahara has been working in the field of counseling since 1988 and facilitating workshops since 1984. She currently works with For Her Nation as a senior mental health counselor and healer. In her spare time, Elder Mahara enjoys walking in nature with her dog, reading, journaling, and doing art. So with that, I'd like to welcome to the stage Elder Mahara. Um, I'm happy to be here today and I'm going to light some smudge for you and say a prayer for you, but I'll just introduce myself with my ancestral name, which is Ayalia Tanat, which means good dreaming woman because of a series of profound dreams I've had in my life that has guided my life. I wouldn't be here if I hadn't listened to my dreams. Um, so uh, when I pray, I, I do it in the way that I've learned over the years. And if you have a different way of praying, I welcome you to do that in your own mind. I don't wish to offend anyone and you don't have to believe anything um, in order to hear this prayer. You can think of it as good thoughts for yourself. Um, I'm happy to uh, be able to do this today it's always a good time when I can offer a prayer from my heart. So I will like this much for you. I've been thinking about you as I was preparing the sage that I'm going to burn now and um, offering good thoughts for you and your work that you're doing and for Vancouver Coastal Health and the good work that it is doing. And so my prayer I offer to the four directions, um, Father Sky, Grandmother Moon, Mother Earth. And I ask for your blessing creator upon each person that is present here today, their loved ones, the prayers that may be or wishes that may be in their hearts at this time. Uh, the burdens that they may be carrying today. I also ask for your blessing, Creator, upon all those who are suffering in any way in the world, those who are in hospitals, institutions, prisons, those who are on the street, those who are involved in addictions, those who are suffering abuse, um, and the situation of those who are abusing others. May they be healed as well, Creator. And a special blessing upon um, our earth, 
that it come into balance and for the hearts and minds of those who are in positions of power in, this re in regard to the environment. I offer a prayer for that, Creator. And um, I'm having renovations done in the house. If you hear any noise, I ask them to be quiet, but I think they've forgotten since then. Um, I'm, uh, I always mention when I do welcomings to the land, which I'm doing now, I'm welcoming you to Coast Salish territory. And um, I say that, you know, welcomings to the land um, must never be lip service. And sometimes it becomes that in some situations. And I think it's very important to do openings because um, as I always say, when um, you don't acknowledge the people of the land, it makes us invisible. And uh, so that's one of the reasons that it's important to do. And I think it's important in many situations, uh, such as when uh, people um, are selling land or buying land here, which happens a lot in the millions and sometimes even billions. As far as I know, there's not a single nod or acknowledgement to whose land is being sold, the land that they're standing on, who it belongs to, and what their name is. And I think that should be a very important part of these interactions. And also, I think that um, the person selling should also um, make contributions to some of our nonprofit organizations that need that funding. You know, as an act of reconciliation, to me, that is an act of reconciliation. And it's important to think about what all those different acts are as we're in this time now. We just had a walk in our community the other day uh, from our community to the site of the St. Paul's Residential School to acknowledge the, um, the search that will be taking place and to acknowledge the, um, the dear children who have, whose bodies have been recovered all over Canada. There will be many, many, many more to come. I had a, a vision of that when I was meditating just a few weeks ago. There's going to be many, many, many bodies found, unfortunately. Um, but it, it's, it's time that this happened. It's time that the truth be revealed. So I think all those things need to be taken in consideration with acknowledgement to the land. And um, I am really wishing you well for your uh, summit today. I hope that it goes very, very well for all of you. And that um, the uh, good work that Vancouver Coastal Health is doing continue on in many different ways that it already has. It's done a lot of a lot of good work already. So I stand behind that and I wish you all a very, very good day. And I'm appreciative to be asked to do this opening today. It's an honor to be able to do that. So um, I wish you well for this uh, beautiful summit that you're going to be doing. Thank you, all my relations. Hi, Elder Mahara. Hi. Thank you so much for taking the time to welcome us all to the day. We're so grateful for you and for your warm and welcoming presence. Um, I just want to say Masi Cho, thank you for ensuring that we were able to start our day for this IPS Summit in a really good way. I especially appreciate your prayers and the fact that you have lit the medicine for us. I know that that goes a long way for all of us who are attending and all of us who are hosting and presenting and bringing this forth. Um, so again, thank you so much for um, joining us today. Um, for, folks, for folks who are just joining, I'd like to take this opportunity to share that we do have a very full schedule for day two of the Indigenous Cultural Safety Summit. We're excited to announce that we will have three keynote speakers throughout the day. We will start off by welcoming Stephanie Pathak and Raven Pathak, who will be providing a very insight 
wonderful um, talk this morning. We will then follow that presentation by um, sharing a performance. We will have the throat singing group, Pick Sick, offer us a performance. Then we will have a lunch break. At that time, we encourage everyone to take the opportunity to ensure that they are taking care of themselves in whatever way feels right to them. That means taking the opportunity to perhaps get up and stretch and ensure that you are moving your body and that you are taking this opportunity to get out and to walk, breathe in that fresh air, take a few breaths. Nice big inhales, nice big exhales, whatever feels right to you as you are on your break at lunchtime. Whether that's nourishing your body and making sure that you're getting the food that you need to move forward with the day and to digest all of that knowledge in a really good way. Or whether that's you taking that opportunity to ensure that you're getting the correct amount of hydration. Following the lunch break, we will encourage folks to join us as we will have a, another keynote that will be Tanya Talaga joining us after lunch and immediately directing, immediately following that, we will have uh, Nigel Chi joining us as our final keynote for the summit. So with that being said, I hope that all of you are enjoying our day so far and settling in in a good way that you have your coffee, your snacks, everything that you need, a note paper, a pen, whatever that may be. We see all of your comments arriving in the chat box. We see everyone who has taken the opportunity to check in with us and to share and acknowledge the territory from which you are joining and from which you are doing this good work. And we truly appreciate you and seeing all of your um, commitment coming to life and being in action. So for that, we thank you. If you haven't already taken the opportunity, please um, acknowledge your territory in the chat box. I'm gonna take this opportunity to uh, welcome our Vice President, Leslie Bonshore, so that she can also help folks settle into a day. It'll be just a moment. Well, hello, good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two. Thank you for joining us. Um, we seem to have a little bit of a, a gap in our timeline here between um, Mahara's lovely welcome and the start of our day uh, to our first speaker, which is at 1020. So I thought maybe if I could just jump on and uh, again, welcome you, introduce myself and talk a little bit about yesterday, um, that we would be able to do that for, for a few more minutes and also entertain some of your questions and comments about yesterday, those of you that were able to attend. So again, welcome, I'm Leslie Bonshore. I'm from the Shiatkin First Nation, also the Nipsack Indian tribe. Um, I am grandmother to Carson and Benson and mom to Party Clayton and Riley and uh, life partner with Mike and uh, auntie and a sister and a friend. Um, I'm calling in today from our office here in East Vancouver on the unceded homelands of the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil my cousins, my relatives, honored to always be in their, um, in their beautiful lands. Uh, drove into sunshine, but now I hear the raindrops on the window, so uh, we're definitely going to have a fall day. Um, full of gratitude to this amazing Indigenous cultural safety team and our Aboriginal health team for their amazing work in preparing the agenda as best they can to make sure that it, you guys are all experiencing um, a day full of knowledge sharing. Um, yesterday, I was able to not only participate along with my uh, two aunties, uh, Brittany and Miranda, to kick off the day and talk about uh, Indigenous women and cultural safety and why it was, was and is always so important to us from that matriarchal viewpoint. Um, and then we went on to, uh, we watched some, some jigging and heard some of the history of the Métis. Um, 
we had a nice nourishing break and uh, I thank you for building that in. And then we had um, uh, Carrie Barassa, who is absolutely amazing. Uh, she did a talk on anti-racism and cultural safety and healthcare. Um, she is most known, well known as being the scientific director of the Canadian Institute of Indigenous Peoples um, Health. And um, just a, a researcher and academic, lots of uh, interesting comments from about the possibilities of adding cultural safety to everything we do from that perspective of uh, the decolonizing of our work and the way we do things. As, um, as Tristan already mentioned, they've got a, a really great lineup of speakers for you today, Stephanie Papet. Um, and then I get the um, honor of interviewing and speaking with Tanya Talaga, who's also a good friend of mine. So I'm excited for that. She's gonna be talking on um, rights before reconciliation. And that's a different spin on what we've been talking about uh, for a long time. Um, we've been using the language and, and the phrase of truth before reconciliation. So truth and reconciliation go hand in hand. Her idea of rights and recon, uh, reconciliation really intrigued me. I can't wait to hear what she has to say about that. And then we've added another amazing speaker. Uh, our last speaker of the day is Nigel Chi um, from New Zealand. So we're always learning from our, our friends and colleagues over in New Zealand. Maori Health has really been the leader in Indigenous cultural safety. And uh, many of us um, learned and researched their work and then applied it to our work here. One of the most interesting pieces that um, we learned from them was really that whole wraparound uh, fauna, fauna aura, that, that idea of taking care of family first, wrapping services and programs around their community members. Um, but Nigel's role has been to support um, their prime minister, uh, Janessa, is that her name? I always forget. Um, I want to say Janessa because I, I think that is, her name's not on his uh, bio, but she has been just a rock star prime minister. Jacinda, <laughs> someone just came and told me, Jacinda. That's right. She's just been so well regarded um, for her response in a number of different areas where she's taking care of her nation and um, uh, New Zealand has demonstrated what it looks like to um, lock down uh, a country early in COVID. So Nigel's played an important role in that. And we look forward to really hearing from him and his experience um, throughout COVID. All of us know that COVID has allowed us the opportunity to learn from each other, to learn from data and act really quickly. And um, certainly New Zealand was one and all of these lessons that we've learned will be very informative for us to reflect on and learn from and, and be prepared uh, better for next time. Well, thank goodness I was able to fill up a little bit of time and again show appreciation and gratitude for all of you for joining us today for um, carving out the time to learn with us to enter this journey of Indigenous cultural safety to be part of the leaping into self-reflection, creating ripples in your ICS journey. Um, today is day two, it's our final day, and we have a lot in store for you. I understand that our um, elder Dennis Joseph from the Squamish Nation has joined us now and is going to continue to build off Mahara's opening comments with a little more grounding exercise and knowledge sharing with us this morning prior to our first speaker at 1020. So Elder Dennis, are you there? I see your little square. There you are. Nice to see you. Welcome, Israel, good day. It is uh, good to be seen, I always say, you know. Uh, you know, I want to uh, hold my hands up to I-L-E, Ya Tanat Mahawar Albright from Tsleil-Waututh, uh, our neighboring family here, I'm from the Squamish Nation. 
and my ancestral name is Kutch Tall. And uh, I'm grateful and thankful to be able to share uh, from my heart with you here today as we've all been uh, recovering from this pandemic in the last 18, coming 19 months. And really uh, what I have to share with you is from my heart because we, um, as elders in the community, um, along with my brother and uh, buddy Joseph and Chief Janice George, as we got early into this pandemic, we got concerned about uh, spiritual and mental health of our our people, especially our survivors. And um, leading up to and the day of the two fifteen that were found in Kamloops, I got a call from my brother. Um, you see, uh, we've been talking about doing something, a, a concert, a ceremony for our survivors in the in this time frame. And when that news broke, we decided that was it. We needed to do something for our survivors. And uh, we did something in three weeks that normally takes about a year to host a ceremony for, for them. And... Squamish Nation leadership follows pretty much the provincial guidelines along with some enhanced guidelines as we're a higher risk group. Um, uh, the leadership said keep the ceremony to at least 15. Uh, no more than 15, including uh, the coordinators, uh, uh, my brother and sister, my wife, Lord. Uh, so we uh, did the best we could. We know there are many, many more survivors that are with us here today. And the day before the uh, event was held uh, seven weeks ago now, um, the doors opened a little bit for half capacity of our building. So we went door to door to our elders following the teaching that you just don't, uh, uh, the real teaching is you have to go personally to invite somebody to to a ceremony. And the challenge uh, for each and every one of us as we split up was to leave our elders uh, building or their homes. Once we got there, they wanted to visit, they wanted a chat, they wanted tea, they wanted toast. And we quickly learned that we needed to leave messages with them to reach out to family that uh, and, and friends that they went to school with to invite them. So overnight, we went from 50 and to over 200 at our local community hall. And it was just an amazing day. Uh, we included our, uh, our longhouse dancers, our high, high dancers that carry ceremonial masks that brush them off. Both groups brush them off through song and dance. Our matriarchs sang for them. And the purpose was to brush them off, to bring them together. And really it was like a huge family reunion for Squamish people who had been apart from so long. We had many great losses uh, uh, throughout this pandemic, natural and related to the pandemic. We've had our share and they were ever so grateful. And along the way after that formal ceremony, finished, um, we opened the floor to them uh, to speak, but we had a surprise for them. A friend of a friend brought a, a live eagle and walked it into the house. And I knew the eagle was coming and arranged for a male and female to escort the eagle in with the handler. And right on cue, everybody stood up and the uh, eagle handler and the escorts walked around the uh, survivors, over 200 of them seated in the middle of our community hall. And it was one of those moments that just sacredness was enhanced by the, that live eagle coming to, to have that visit to take care and um, allow that door to be open for for our elders to, to survivors to free themselves. And by that, I mean, for over two hours, um, 
All those survivors offered encouraging words. There were disclosures. There was healing. And following that, we had a, a feast uh, per COVID protocol. We had to have lunch boxes provided for them. And to the person, everybody that participated in that ceremony um, volunteered their time from the ceremony of dancers, singers. Um, you see, it's um, very expensive to be an Indigenous person. We usually uh, quote unquote hire singers, hire dancers, and we take care of them, especially if they travel a great distance to participate. Historically, it would have been food, it would have been clothing, it would have been ceremonial objects that were used to hire people, but everybody understands the sacred currency of, of money today. And that sacred currency is alive and well in Coast Salish territories. It was a blessed day for our survivors and uh, the more than 200 that were there um, were ever grateful. Um, we spoke to many after that could not be there uh, wanting to do more and uh, Squamish Nation held another uh, three weeks later and it was uh, equally attended if not more, especially by those who couldn't be there from the first one. During this pandemic, uh, my brother and I, we became concerned uh, about passing teachings on and my today, we opened a family page for our nieces and nephews and grand nieces and nephews. Uh, every three weeks we would gather um, much like this and invite our language teacher. My One of my younger sisters teaches the language. We all did storytelling, provided teachings to the nieces and nephews. Being an echo for those elders that we heard as young men and young women in our longhouses passing those teachings along. Um, our longhouse has been shut down uh, throughout Coast Salish Tory, uh, territory. And it's been a challenge for all of our communities. Even though we could celebrate at home our songs and dances, uh, which we do, uh, the ancient form of spirituality to share in who and what we are, to share our song. We all have a sacred song, the uh, elders tell us, that we're born with. And it's up to us to bring that song out. And uh, sometimes it's brought through initiation. There's another way to do it is to walk in the woods, to be by yourself for, for days. And every once in a while, the, I call it the sacred highway in the sky where a song will open up and it's up to you to hear it. I want to share that uh, uh, song with you now that belongs to me. It's called Anina. Is a word that I heard growing up, especially when I fell as a toddler and as a young man. I'm in the middle of uh, 11 kids. I have five older brothers and sisters, five younger brothers and sisters. So I heard that word quite a bit. And my mother um, uh, told me, um, you know, when I asked her when I got older, uh, I said, mom, what does that word mean? Anina, and she said, um, it's a Squamish word to, to keep your soul, to keep your spirit together, especially when you fall. And throughout your life, you're gonna fall. And it's up to you to get up. She said, but every once in a while, you need help. And that word, Anina, is to keep your soul, your spirit, together because when you get up when you fall and, and move on sometimes your spirit stays there and that word is to bind you back together maybe you're together already but we need to make sure so we share that there's other squamish words in there um, chase yam is for the creator tisha ochomeo his mother earth 
and Munt Munt is for all of our children, especially the unborn, the ones that are yet to come, and also to honor those that are we are celebrating this last few days with our orange shirts. Again, my hands are up to you for listening to my words and I'll share that song with you now. Oh, yeah. On in Hands are up to each and every one of you. Grateful and thankful. Blessing each and every one of you once again and thanking uh, my sister Mahara Albright I Eli Tanat OCM. Thanking you, friends and relatives from the four directions. Grateful and thankful for your work and I'm always grateful uh, as you serve people as well. Osia, all my relations. Thank you so much, Elder Dennis, for sharing that song with us and sharing some of your teachings. We really appreciate it. I'm feeling very grounded. It's always a good day when we're able to start off by hearing from not one, but two or more elders. So again, we're grateful to have heard from Elder Mahara and having her welcome us all to the stage. We're grateful to Elder Dennis for sharing some of his teachings, some of his stories, and of course, a wonderful song. And then as always, we're grateful to our Vice President Leslie Bonjour for sharing more about our day to come. So with that being said, I'm going to introduce everyone to our first keynote session. We will be having a session titled, It Starts With Me, 
steps and tools to support our embracing of our future together. It Starts With Me is an interactive, safe, and fun session that will honor the growing and diverse knowledge and wise practices in the journey of providing culturally safe emergency management services. This session will be hosted by both Raven and Stephanie Papik. So I'm gonna start off by sharing their bios and then inviting them onto the screen. Raven Papik is a two-spirited non-binary Inuvialuit, Dene and Métis. Their mixed background informs their practice and engagement with social justice and community. They are a third generation residential school survivor and have lived experience of addiction, trauma, queer identity, and surviving the ongoing attempts at colonization of the many people of Turtle Island. They are a student in the counseling profession, plant medicine work, and musician with a focus on cultural safety and wellness for queer and indigenous identities. Stephanie Pathic is a public servant, social entrepreneur, artist, and parent. She was born in Akecho territory, Northwest Territory, and grew up in Makwangan territory. She is of Inuit and European ancestry. She is the mother of two children now in their 20s. At the age of 24, Stephanie moved to Yellowknife, Northwest Territory to learn more about her culture and strengthen her family relations. She returned to Vancouver Island and for 15 plus years, Stephanie has been in provincial government, including six years as lead for the Indigenous Youth Internship Program which won the Public Sector BC Workplace Inclusion Award for diverse and inclusive cultural champions. In 2017, Stephanie was appointed to the Priorities and Accountability Office in the Office of the Premier of BC to assist with the transition to a new government. She then moved on to and has been with Emergency Management BC since 2018 as the Director for Strategic Integration of Indigenous Knowledge, Cultural Safety, and Humility. So with that, I would like to pass the floor over to Stephanie and Raven Pathic. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. I'm just going to take a moment to uh, share my screen. Um, And uh, <clears throat> hopefully that works. Who can share? There we go. Um, yeah. Maybe while I get our text sorted out, I'll uh, ask, ask Raymond to start our presentation off in a good way. Thank you. Uglemi, Atira, Tugvak, Papik. Good morning, my name is Raven Pathik. Uh, this is my mother. I'm grateful to be here today. I want to start us off by saying, Masi Notsi, Asire Jean Ga Masi. Thank you, Creator. Thank you for all of these things. We're here. I want to say thank you to our, our lovely hosts and um, all of those whose time and work and energy and organizing has brought us to be here today. And, uh, learning together and, and on this journey together. I want to thank the uh, elders as well for speaking. Uh, Mahara and Dennis, thank you. Your, your teachings and your wisdom and your your songs are, are very powerful in a good way to, to start this off. So, Masicho Kaina for that. Um, my pronouns are they, them. I'm 22. Um, thank you for the introduction with the bio as well. Um, I'm Mostly, I'm just grateful to be here. So thank you. And with that, I'll, I'll hand it back to Stephanie to talk more about our presentation today. Uvami, good morning. I'm calling in with deep gratitude from Husekum, which translates to Place of Clay, also known as James Bay here in Lekwungen Territory. And in particular, hold deep gratitude to the elders and matriarchs and, and many community community members who've been really generous in sharing knowledge and teachings over the years to help me to learn how to walk in a good way while I'm a visitor here. And uh, also raise my hands to elders Mahara and elder Dennis for 
for your uh, prayers, for your guidance today, and, and for sharing some teachings. I'm all, always so grateful to, to hear teachings. As a, a visitor to these territories, protocol for, for my culture is to follow the protocols and teachings of the, of the lands that I'm on. So thank you. This is a, a workshop that we first kind of started doing while uh, running the Indigenous Youth Internship Program, a uh, leadership development program with the province of BC. And then when it came to emergency management uh, in 2018, there was following the call, following the 2017 and 2018 fires, a call for more compassionate emergency management services. And this is a theme we're starting to see across the board as we have the report with the in plain sight. And uh, yeah, so this is a record. This is a, a session that we were, will be recorded. And you know, a gentle message I always like to share in any training that I offer is that if you've been told that it's mandatory to be here, you now that you've arrived, you're welcome to stay. And also know that you know, at any time, if you need to to step away, your your presence is no longer mandatory, but you are are welcome. It's so important, I think, to invite folks to be here by choice and to have that choice to create a positive learning environment for everybody else. And this also aligns with the neuroscience in terms of how our brains work. I have a, I have a bachelor, a little bit about me. So uh, I'm Inuk and, uh, I've been, and I'm on my dad's side and Irish and Spanish ancestry with, on my mom's side. And uh, my background, I'm a little bit of a nerd. I have honors, bachelor of science with distinction. Um, and so I love to weave in some of that science into the cultural safety and humility work that I do. All right, uh, so just moving to our next slide and just like to, I'm really grateful that folks have been doing, uh, offering acknowledgements for those, for the territories they're on something that um, I think is so important to teaching from elders to acknowledge every day the, the lands and the ancestors and to ask for support and doing good work while we're visitors here. And I just thought I'd pop in the chat there for folks. Um, the First People's Culture Council uh, website for people to if it's your if you're not sure which territories you're on, they've made a really beautiful uh, interactive map so that people can find out which territories that they're on. All right. And so in terms of our intentions today is, is really to uh, to is to create that space to give that we're going to start out to give that bigger picture. I always like to start there like why why do we bother? Why is this important? Uh, and then create that safe space for us to step into so that we can have open hearts and open minds to, to learning. I also just like to acknowledge that many of you are already on your learning and practice for reconciliation journey. And so this is really meant to build on those existing skills and abilities and knowledge that each of you already have. And our hope is too to make some time to, for reflection, sharing, and then thinking about now that we've heard what we know, what we know, how can we start to implement that and bring that into our lives? So that's our intentions for our time together. I just want to note uh, we will be doing storytelling and we'll be doing collective story harvesting. And, and a little trigger warning for the storytelling, as you can imagine, in this work of reconciliation, and as we already heard from the elders, part of this is time is, is that truth telling. And, and so some there, there will be, a, yeah, just that little trigger warning, plant that seed now for when we come to the storytelling. So one of my favorite things when I bring people together is to offer agreements for our time together. This is something that I first learned through the Circle Way, which is a, um, a nonprofit organization that looks at, uh, brings people together in circle and likes to share circle. And I, uh, it really resonated with me. And then when, as I learned more about my Inuit culture, I saw like the, the connection of uh, agreements are a way to create a calling in culture. Uh, this is something when I first shared some of the circle way agreements, like 
an uh, invitation to listen with curiosity and compassion, with discernment rather than judgment, um, uh, to take what you need, offer what you can, takes any hierarchy that exists, puts it on its side and recognizes shared leadership. So that also means if you need, you know, if you got an important phone call from a loved one, please step away and take that. Or if you need to uh, take care of yourself for a moment, please do. It's so important. And uh, so I had these agreements that I was sharing from the circle way with indigenous youth in the internship program. And then they started making up their own. I was like, oh my gosh, you can make up your own agreements. Of course you can. And so an example of that, uh, we were having our bi-weekly check-ins and folks are really excited and talking over each other in the meeting. And, and so afterwards, uh, a youth said, you know, I'm feeling really, uh, I just don't feel heard and I'm feeling kind of frustrated and I'm not sure how to address that. So we thought about how could we address that in a strength-based way? Uh, and then at the next check-in, when we said, you know, would anyone like to offer an agreement for the time together, our time together, they put up their hand and they said, yes, could you, uh, could we show respect for each other by honoring each other's words with silence? And I'm like, yeah. And, you know, maybe we didn't do it right away all the time and we forget. And then there's that gentle nudge and no blame, no shame. Just that, that power of repetition creates new neural pathways and that strength-based way. It activates our prefrontal cortex, so it puts us in our planning, thinking, compassionate brain. And what I found was over time, we were able to quickly within that year, create a culture shift. Uh, and so really coming into space together with intentionality, you'll see there that iceberg and um, it's the idea the top part is our conscious self and the lower part below the water is our, our unconscious self. And just by making this time together to offer agreements and how we wanna support each other in this learning environment uh, can lower that watering line. And so we're gonna move to Menti in a moment. Uh, and one more thing though I wanna share is you'll notice this hand clasp there picture. And it's something I like to offer just because so our brains don't necessarily separate emotional safety from physical safety. And so sometimes when we're learning new things, uh, it can trigger our brain. And so it can start, we can feel like we're not safe. And, and so I just like to offer this little hand clasp exercise. You could clasp your hands together. And then just notice which thumb's on top. There's no right or wrong, bad or good. My uh, right finger is on top. And then so you can unclasp your hands and then shift them the other, other way. So now your other thumb's on top. And I'm not sure how it feels. I know when I do this in real life, people often say it feels uncomfortable. How's it mm -hmm. feeling for you? A little yeah, awkward? Yeah, a little, a little awkward for sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. And maybe we just invite in a nice deep breath. And just know that over time, if we with intentionality, start to practice new things, new ways of being, and those deep belly breaths uh, that we heard as encouragements earlier, that, that can just help our brain. And then if that's still not working, another fun trick I learned is you can look over one shoulder, look back over your other shoulder, say, I'm safe. And then that again will just trick your brain and it'll be like, oh yeah, you are safe. There's no saber tooth coming, you're okay. So uh, we're gonna move to Menti and you'll see uh, this is something kind of like Slido. Uh, so instead you'll go to menti.com and then there's this code here, or you could also type it in the chat too. So whatever feels more comfortable for you, you're welcome to put it in. And you'll see you can enter in uh, an agreement and then we'll start to see a word cloud appear. And if there is an agreement that really resonates with you, you can type that one in again and, and it will start to uh, populate. And in the meantime, though, I'm gonna, just going to check in and uh, see if uh, you have an agreement you would like to offer for our time together, Raven. Yeah, you spoke a little bit about using different tools to ground ourselves with the uncomfortability that kind of comes up. And I think that's a that's a really beautiful offering and agreement is that um, if we don't already have tools, that there are tools being shared in this space to come back to presence with ourselves and the moment and each other. Um, 
that ability to respond, that response ability that we have is, is an agreement that, that I think can honor our shared leadership and our, our present engagement um, with, with the space, you know, with ourselves, with each other. So that's, that's one I might have to offer for sure. Awesome. Thank you so much, Raymond. And I see quite a few folks have been participating. Uh, we've got respect is really resonating, openness, understanding, uh, listening and hearing. That's something I hear elders say, you know, we've got two ears and one mouth, so <laughs> can do lots of listening. Open heart and open mind, strength and humanity, acceptance, yes unconditional love so powerful it's been transformative in my in my life interest reflecting unity i love this love Beautiful. listening hope comfort wonderful we're creating the space together empathy allyship mm -hmm. Non-judgment, yes, there's uh, no right or wrong. There's lots of different ways of being and seeing in the world. And so just uh, opening our hearts and minds to those. Uh, compassion, so important. Oh, I just love how, how active this is. Authentic listening, nice, nice. I love it. Gratitude, yes. Gratitude for each and every one of you being here today and, and for your participation. And I, focus, yes. Presence, I know, yeah, often, especially in this, uh, since we've moved to online, <clears throat> that uh, invitation, I know sometimes, yeah, just to be really present and mm -hmm. let go of all of the other distractions and, and invite in that being present. Mm -hmm. Trust, wonderful. Loving kindness, mindfulness. Shen Chen Soe. I love that. Hmm. Breath, yes, so important. And I, I love that there is the reminder uh to do that this evening and actually i think what we're gonna do in a moment is just one of the things yeah just curious i think how these are landing for people usually if we have an option to do like a little thumbs up or something um maybe we'll just take a moment uh these are really resonating for me and i'm really grateful and i'd love just to take a little moment to do a grounding exercise to ground us into these agreements that we're so generously offering for ourselves and each other for this next little while uh so i don't know about you if you've been uh sitting lots or not but if you want you're welcome to stand up for a minute get out of our seats try not to knock anything over and maybe if you like, you don't have to, it's all an invitation and just uh, if there's a window you could look out or something just to also stretch our eyeballs. I know we've, uh, can, you know, it's good to do that little bit of exercise and maybe just want to shake out an arm, shake out another arm and just really listen to your body. So if your body's like, nope, don't want to do that. It's so important to listen to it. Your body knows best. You know, maybe shake out a leg, shake out another Kiana could put your arms above the air and just move around your body, feel a little silly, move around a little bit, shake it out, let out some of that tension. I mean, coming into stillness, maybe you want to go on your tippy toes, then back onto your heels, then finding that center in your feet, feeling that connection to Mother Earth, coming energy coming up through your legs to your knees tilting your pelvic bone forward and rolling your shoulders back. You can imagine a thread pulling your head tall, just having a soft gaze forward or your eyes closed, whatever feels most comfortable. Bringing awareness to your breath without any judgment, just noticing your inhale 
and your exhale. Maybe taking a moment to deepen that breath, bringing in the oxygen, and then exhaling through your mouth. And just inviting in a little self check in. If you're feeling a little sleepy, maybe you haven't had a, enough of that coffee or tea today, you could practice extending your inhale, making it longer than your exhale. Bringing in that oxygen into your lungs, into your blood, and exhale. Or maybe you're feeling a little nervous, a little anxious, a little bit of extra energy. You could play with extending your exhale, making that a little bit longer than your inhale. So we'll just take a couple of moments to do some breath on our own and that opportunity to self-regulate through your breath. And you could play with either or, or none and just breathe. Perhaps we can do a nice big inhale together on the next one, two, three, and exhale, two, three, and one more nice inhale together, two, three, and exhale, two, three. Then coming back to present, opening your eyes, wiggling your fingers, your toes, coming back into your chairs. Wonderful. <clears throat> Thank you so much. I, I love doing that grounding exercise. It just even helps me because uh, believe it or not, I used to be mortified in public speaking. <laughs> so my inner child still comes out sometimes and says, what are you doing, Stephanie? <laughs> Uh, so before, uh, now we're just going to talk a little bit uh, about language. It's, it's such an important piece. So I'm going to hand it over to Raven. Thanks, Stephanie. So <clears throat> this call to attention to language is about a shift in terminology. Some of you may have heard terms like uh, sensitivity training, uh, cultural awareness, and these really represent stages on the journey, beginning with cultural awareness, and that's an awareness of our own cultural identity, cultural identity of others, and maybe a, a larger, more broad sense, and cultivating a sensitivity to the nuance and diversity that each of us hold, um, as well as some of the awareness of the impact of your of our own cultures with our people. Um, you know, wh who am I? Where do I come from? And what are the impacts resulting from my cultural? beliefs, understandings, whether they're conscious or unconscious, and their potential impacts on the world around me, other people. Um, so we shift that to practicing cultural humility. Cultural humility builds relationships founded in mutual trust and respect and enables cultural safety. So that cultural humility, we ground ourselves, we, we're cultivating a relationship with ourselves, um, reflecting on our place within society, within our relationships and thinking about what that means, how we can honor the humanity within ourselves and honor the humanity within those around us that we meet. And that in, in a deeper sense, not saying everyone is just human and having that kind of broad view, but holding that space of each of us are unique. Each of us have different needs and wants and ways of interacting with the world and each other. And so holding that space to engage um with with that care with that love with that curiosity and compassion and that's what enables that cultural safety so we're moving away from even this idea of the pan-indian approach you know um not all indigenous people are alike and oftentimes we can say first nations that um leaves out the inuit and metis you know because there's the inuit first nations and metis and the first nations that are here on Turtle Island, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different specific nations, each with different cultures, practices, ways of being, where the Western world has taught us of the classic Indian with the, you know, the little feather in the back and the, the headband, maybe wearing a buckskin something. So we're moving 
from these ideas to more a nuanced human way of being um, and recognizing diversity in cultures and needs. Um, I wanna say a piece around building our knowledge around gender as well. Our language around gender, exampling pronouns, she, her, he, him, they, them, um, and we all have pronouns. Everything is pronouns. It's a fundamental part of the English language. We could say it, you know, it is over there. The tree, it is over there. And that is still a pronoun, right? So we offer a cultural shift from our assigned social understanding of ourselves and others in the context of the gender binary to one that's holding space for the exploration and the deconstruction of gender and patriarchal hierarchies. So we're decolonizing our perspective of ourselves and others <clears throat> and allowing space for more nuance, more humanity. It, it may even be on a surface level and the only the language changes in regards to um, supporting pronouns. The shift in language to support chosen pronouns with curiosity builds a space for openness and safety with which to connect more deeply, emphasize, empath empathize with and gain an understanding of any other individual or collective we are engaged with outside of our own unconscious biases and the potential social stereotypes that, that come up. Um, so I think that's that for all I have to say on attention to language. Thanks, Raven. <clears throat> and I just know the comment, yeah, around it's, you know, it's so important to take that distinction appraised distinction-based approach when we're talking and put it into context of what we're talking about. You know, if we're talking about the land, then yes, of course, we're talking about BC First Nations here in BC. If we're talking about health, like today, when we talk about Indigenous people, then we're talking about First Nations, Métis, and Inuit who all live here. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to share that. And um, and then move us on to our next slide. And I appreciate the comments. And yeah, I know language can be interesting things. Sometimes people, it's so personal and, and it can bring up some uh, some big emotions. And, and so it's definitely a journey and, and you know, it takes a little while to create new habits. So as I try to bumble along, I try to be kind to myself and then also correct myself so that I can, do better. Yeah, one piece I want to say quickly before I move on from that is I know people have said, oh, you know, you're you're native, you're indigenous to me. And I and I I've heard people respond say, no, no, I'm I'm Inuit. No, I'm not native. I'm I'm Dene. No, I'm not native or First Nations. I'm uh Stolo, you know. So moving that language even from over to I'm not native, I'm not indigenous, I am, and then we say the name of our nation holding that space. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Raven. All right, so that big picture of, of why bother, and I like to call this a quadruple word score because uh, not only is it of, can be a benefit to helping us to do our work better, but I've also had people tell me in doing this kind of that self-awareness, self-reflection and discovery not only helps them to have better relationships at home and with family and community, but also with themselves. And you can see here, there's many ways that are kind of driving us towards this pathway of change. And, and I really love the First Nations Health Authority campaign of it starts with me, creating that climate of change, or the idea of, I don't know if you've heard the story of the hummingbird in the forest fire, uh, there's a forest fire happening and um, and this little hummingbird wanted to know how to do its best to help out and so it just went to the river and it filled its tiny little beak with water and then went towards the fire and inspired other other forest creatures to also help put out the fire and so you know uh, sometimes it can feel overwhelming there's so many pieces with the, especially with climate change the pandemic the opioid crisis the in plain sight, there's all of these things that Me Too movement that are, are showing that need for this big culture shift uh, to be uh, kind, inclusive and a safe place for each and every one of us. So that big picture. So I know some people have been wondering, probably, when are we going to get into the learning? And, and this is something that I like to say, you know, the learning's already begun. A big part of this work is that relational work, that creating that space, checking in with each other, co-creating that space. 
space and, and um, just kind of slowing down and making some of that time for the relational so important to recognize that, that we're humans and we come with feelings and complexity. So uh, I, the self-discovery and awareness, this comes particularly from the Indigenous Relations Behavioral Competencies, which were created by the province of BC in 2012. And I'd just like to honor and acknowledge Peg Christensen, who uh, was the Indigenous primary pen holder, the author for this work, and engaged with over 90 Indigenous public servants and community members to create these competencies to support people in their uh, Indigenous relations. And so this is a publicly available to all people. And you'll notice in the title, uh, I was gifted from Bradley Dick, uh, Yahweh Lipton, a, a good friend and colleague, uh, received permission to share uh, not samat, which is translates to working with one heart, one mind, that idea of many hands make for light work. And so really embody that in these in these competencies. <clears throat> and the, the one that is one of my favorites is the competency of self-discovery and awareness. And um, just like to acknowledge that there's all kinds of learners out there. There's audio learners, visual learners, kinetic learners. So some of you might be doodling right now. So you stay focused and that's great. And, and as part of for the audio learners, uh, we're just going to read out uh, the description for self-discovery and awareness. Did you wanna do that? <clears throat> Understanding one's thoughts, feelings, values, and background, and how they impact the success of the interaction and relationship, or how they may influence one's work. It is recognizing one's own biases by tracing them to their origins through reflection and by noticing one's own behavior, and then intentionally seeking a way forward that positively impacts the interaction and relationship. It means maintaining new ways of thinking and acting when situations become difficult or uncertain, or in times of urgency. Thanks, Raven. And um, for me, yeah, emergency management, I really love that that was in there. It's like, yes, this is written for us because I know sometimes in emergency, we think there's not enough time, but I have all the time we really need to uh, be uh, still being mindful in those times. Oh, thanks so much for this, uh, this reference here uh, for, for gen self-directed gender learning course. Thanks so much for sharing that, Nicole, really embodying the spirit of shared leadership in our workshop today so thank you it's perfect it's what i love uh and so now as we learned a little bit about the competency of self-discovery and awareness it's going to move us into collective story harvesting and storytelling and so I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with collective story harvesting. It comes from the art of hosting. In particular, I learned it from Amanda Fenton. I learned it first as her inviting me to be a storytelling teller uh, at a collective story harvest for um, XY Boom an intergenerational conference. And uh, story collective story harvesting is uh, it's a really great tool, uh, an alternative for many things like if you do panels, this is a, a nice alternative to, to doing a panel. Uh, you can use it for project management. Uh, you can use it for complex situations. There's a, a endless really possibilities uh, in terms of ways that you can use collective story harvesting. You can use that as a way of collecting data for any of those data gurus out there who, who work with the numbers mm. and it's such an important part. And uh, yeah, I just find it can create a rich learning field. It creates that learning from within. So rather than kind of going through and just telling you about the different parts of um, how self-discovery and awareness looks at, we'll, we'll have that emerge through the storytelling so that that learning can come from within. So in terms of the process of what will happen, we're going to invite, we're gonna share some theme captures or some lenses, which will invite you to listen. Raven's going to be our storyteller today. And so we'll be inviting you to listen with uh, some themes that we're presenting as well. If none of those are resonating with you, you're also always welcome to uh, listen with your own personal lens. 
Then we're going to move into some collective story harvesting, the sharing back what we heard based on the lens that we were listening with. Uh, and then some of that, yeah, just some opportunity for reflection and sharing. Then we'll hear back from Raven. After our collective story harvesting, we'll be linking the It Starts With Me and, um, and the, our learning and practice for reconciliation journey, and then move on to now that we've heard what we've heard, uh, how can we integrate this into our lives and, and take care of ourselves? So that's the last, that's kind of our next little bit. And then we'll end with a, a checkout. So here we are, we're going to move to, we've got four theme catchers for you today. If you want, you can take uh, your pen and paper and just like note down, um, you know, which lens you'd like to listen. And if, as you're listening to Raven, tell their story, you're welcome to take notes. As well, if you just rather practice your oral history skills, you're welcome to, to just listen and then share back. We'll be using the mentee so that sharing will be anonymous uh, in, in that space. So that is the process. And we're gonna go to our first theme catcher. So the first theme catcher is listening for narratives within the story. How do they influence attitudes, behaviors, and actions? What did you notice? What did you see, feel, and hear? Um, anytime there's a narrative of bad and good, we can other and disconnect from the humanity in each other. We remember the importance of curiosity and compassion as ground tools for understanding others. This reawakens our humanity. How are our views and projections shaped by the media and the world, maybe others in our lives? We often could say, I would never be like that. I would never be racist, you know? Um, and that dulls our own capacity when we're perpetuating these things. It's that we are allowing for the full scope of our humanity. We are fallible. We make error. We have unconscious biases. We are shaped by the world around us. And those influence our thoughts, behaviors, and actions. So that piece around narrative, that's, that's a little bit about what that is. Thanks, Raven. And the second theme catcher is... Uh, listening invitation to listen for moments of observing one's own behaviors and actions. And just in the story, just noticing what those behaviors and actions contributed uh, and what shifts did you notice? So that's our, our second theme catcher. And then our third one builds on some more of that humanity. So listening for humanity, moments of humanity in the story. What did you see, feel, hear? Is there anything you want to add to this one? Um, I like the what Gabor Mate talks about when asking, where's that quote? Not asking why the addiction, but asking why the pain. And that kind of offers that piece around moving from the Western world and how it immediately will treat symptoms as individual pieces rather than looking at the roots of the cause. You know, where do these things come from? Acknowledging that we have a deep, complex, rich stories and culture. Um, and so much deep being that goes into the now presentation for how we are perceived and project ourselves into this world. Um, and so that kind of piece around humanity, you know, that, that reflects that again. Thank you. And then our last listening lens is our fourth one, uh, listening for opportunities to develop self-awareness, whether that's personally or in others. Uh, what kind of ripple effects were there? What did you see, hear, feel? So those are our four lenses. And then of course, always invite to, if you'd prefer just to listen, if none of those were resonating with you, uh, you're welcome just to, to listen with your own personal lens and, and share back as well when we're into that piece. And so I'm going to uh, leave these four listening lenses. Uh, you can picture whichever one resonates with you. And uh, we're going to listen to Raven tell their own personal story and journey around self-discovery and awareness. And uh, again, just like to offer uh, a little trigger warning uh, as, as that piece. And 
And um, after we're done with story, we'll do another little grounding exercise just so that we can uh, reground ourselves. And uh, so with that, um, I hand it over to you. Thank you, Stephanie. <clears throat> so before I start, I want to share a couple pieces of the teachings that I know around listening and being with storytellers. One of the things that I've heard, and I think it's a teaching from the West Coast, is to uncross our hands and our legs. And this puts our body into the place where we have an open heart. When we do this, you know, we're or we're doing that or our legs are crossed up, you know, we're, we're closing ourselves off. And so we do that as a sign of respect. We're opening ourselves up and we're grounding into presence and we're honoring each other's words in that. And I can invite you to maybe put both of your feet on the ground if that's comfortable and take a deep breath. Now is a good time to drop back into yourself and your presence. So thank you. I was 13 when I first tried to take my own life. I didn't have a context or identity for my pain. I had been raised for the first five or six years of my life or surrounded by my cousins, my family, the land, and an illusion or a grounded, both grounded in community, regardless if there was the pains and the struggles and the interpersonal difficulties that come with any family, there was still that community. Before long, um, events had it that we ended up leaving that space and the north and I as a little brown kid was taken into the the big white world of the west coast and dropped into school and that was okay for a while things started to come up in myself as I as I went through my journey as I was aging and there started to be pain and anxiety and depression, these things in my body that I did not quite understand or could not put context for. I knew I wanted to return to, to the North, to home, to this idea, this internalized utopia. You know, we think of child wonder, you know, it was that seeking, that aching to return to this. And so it was, a few years later that I ran away from home for the first time and I think I was eight or nine and that was a call from my my mother to say okay you know this kid wants to go back up north pretty bad so I went back up north for a year and what I came back to was not how it was when I'd left. By that time, my aunties, my uncles, they had divorced, they had moved away, and my dad had been there, and he had been in his own pain for those years we had been gone. He had been struggling, and but he had been okay, and he had a new partner. <clears throat> and to say the least, it was not happy. Um, I could see in retrospect very much how the patterns of of trauma from residential schools that had played out in his life he was playing out in mine and i was experiencing those that direct lineage from the way my grandfathers were taught in residential schools and the way that they were abused in residential schools to the way they had hurt their children to the way they became my parents and the way that they had hurt me in those ways I ended up only being up there a year before it was too much. And I went running back to my mom. There was more safety. There was more understanding. There was more space. And then um, my 13-year-old self growing up in Victoria, BC, before this, um, my 13-year-old self began to create an identity through pain. On my second day in school, I met another indigenous youth who taught me about things like drinking and smoking and self-harm. And suddenly all of this pain and confusion and hurt inside of me that I did not understand began to have a voice. 
and this was self-destructive this was destructive to myself to others but it was a necessary part of my journey to explore and unfold into these expressions of of, of pain creating identity through pain and that took its toll over the next couple of years with a few attempts on my own life culminating to um, a deeper and harder addiction. A year or two later, my mom learned about residential schools and we started to have a context, understand why the pain, where that was coming from. Suddenly <clears throat> the behaviors of our grandfathers, uh, my father, the different people in our life began to make sense why they were silent, why they were angry, why they were the way they were and why they had been that way to us. It began to click and make sense. We began to have that awareness of where all of this was culminating to our experiences in our now and daily life that without that awareness was just pain, was just hurt, was just damaged relationships. <clears throat> when I was, I think, 15 or 16, um, I had ended up living on my own. Uh, for a variety of circumstances. And by that time, I'd passed through a major addiction. And I had a panic attack, and I was um, freaking out. And I, at that point, was still struggling with suicidal ideation. And I had been talking with my mom, and my mom was worried about me. So they called the emergency helpline. And the emergency helpline called me. I didn't recognize the number, and I was in a state of crisis, so I, I hung up. I didn't want to talk to anyone. Five minutes passed, 10 minutes passed, and I started starting to come back down. I was starting to calm down from this really heightened place. And I went outside to have a cigarette and starting to come back down, a police car rolled up very, very quickly. And three officers came out and they said, are, are you, are you Raven? Said, uh, yeah, yeah said, okay, you know, we we heard something was going on. We, we came here to, to check on you. So yeah, I'm, I'm okay, I'm, I'm coming down. And, and at that point I was done my smoke. So I went and I took a step or two to put out my smoke. Immediately they perceived my, my slight motion as me about to run. I, three officers then tackled me rushed me and tackled me and held me to the ground with such force. They handcuffed me and I still have nerve damage from how tightly my wrists were bound by those metal cuffs. They led me and they put me into their car and I was crying and I was panicking even more now. I was back in that heightened fight or flight. I didn't know what was going on, just I was suddenly taken by force off the street from where I was calming down. And they, when they put me in the back of the car, they turned on the radio and they started to play the music. And I, I said through my panic, could you, could you please, you know, not have the radio? I'll go, I'll go with you, you know, but just please, it's, it's a lot. I don't want top 40 tunes blaring as I'm handcuffed in the back of your car. And the officers turned up the radio. They turned it on to max volume to blast that noise at me. They took me to the Royal Jubilee Hospital where I was escorted out. And at this point I was not resisting. I was very compliant. I said, okay, you know, I'll go with you, whatever, whatever's gotta happen here. So they brought me in and they moved me from the handcuffs to strapping me to a bed where I strapped my hands and my feet down. There, the nurses, they left me for 45 minutes alone, still panicking, strapped to a bed. And I was not resisting any of this. 45 minutes passed and the nurse comes in, says, you know, are you gonna, are you gonna work with us here? I said, yes. Oh yeah. <laughs> I know what happens if you, if you resist to any degree at this point. So I said, yes. And so they unbound me. And after that, they could see I was masking, trying to be more calm and go along with whatever it is they said so that no harm would come to me. I would not be strapped to any more tables. And they decided at that point I was okay. So they put me in a guest in a, in a shared common room space to sleep for the night before they released me in the morning. That was 
one of the six suicide attempts I made in this five or six year span of time. Going through all of these different things, being in and out of hospital, seeing different counselors, seeing different therapists, the pieces that have always, always stuck with me were when the counselors had an understanding of the intergenerational trauma that that I that intergenerational trauma that I have that my family has they had a, a some rough understanding of the culture I was coming from and the ways that an indigenous people who are now experiencing the modern world modern day colonization this was a space that held me that held me in context regardless of who they were if they could contextualize these things then I would be okay my mother in their learning journey with residential schools began to take a harm reductionist support role in these ways of, you know, it's not just simply bad and outlaw the, the drinking, the smoking, the drugs, whatever. How can we make this safe? How can we provide these safe ways of accessing this and reduce the harm rather than stop that, that black and white binary of bad and good, that there is no bad or good, that non-judgmental support I really credit that, that kind of being for the reasons that I'm still alive today, where I know so many other people are not alive today. I have a 13 year old friend on a reserve who, who killed herself. When I reconnected with my siblings in the North, um, who I'm the eldest of 10, um, eight by my father, um, my, my, the eldest of the boys who was 10 at the time talked to me and came to me and talked about wanting to kill himself. We talked and we, I, I talked him through that, but there was not that support from our, our shared father or, or his stepmother or understanding or that context. And so I know he still struggles on his own journey to this day in that. So these things, these like simple pieces of research understanding that harm reduction approach has made my life made me able to be here today having um access to information you know access to, to tools for learning about breath about narrative therapy about spirituality having a cultural context to share in and support non-judgment and being supported through accessing those resources. That has been everything, everything. And the only reason that I'm here today with an A, a score, an adverse childhood experiences score of eight. And I don't know if uh, who in the audience knows about the adverse childhood experiences study, but it's worth looking into. Um, it, it's, it's on a scale of depending on what you experience as a, as a, as a child. Um, kind of what is the foundation and potential path for your life. Most people rank anywhere from a two to a four. Anyone who has attended residential schools and guaranteed almost anyone who is Indigenous is easily six up for those, those numbers. And that means high risk for suicide, high risk for mental and physical health issues, high risk for addiction, um, all of these things. So in many of these ways, so many of my relatives, so many of my, so much of my family, we should not even be alive psychologically with the things that we have been through, the things that we've experienced, the barriers we still experience, we should not be alive, but we carry on in that way. And that's some of that culture, some of that context that has kept me safe in my journey. Some of that shifting from, I remember, you know, being maybe 11 or 12 and seeing these other kids at the school you know, very light skinned and they're happy. They have this privilege, they have access to money and these different things. And I thought, I, I wanna be like them. I wanna at least fit in and be happy. And I remember going online and researching how to bleach my skin. How can I make myself not, not this skin color? Because it, there's that deep shame that is, that is unspoken, that is not talked about for, for who we are. And it's so ingrained in our children in, in the children, if there's not conversation, if there's not that context spoken of, and I'm grateful to have not done that. And now I feel a, a deeper sense of pride in myself and my identity and my culture and my family, and know that this is, a, is this is a journey that we're on, and we're on together, you know, and we all have that learning to do.
So I want to thank you all for, for being such good listeners. And thank you for holding space, Stephanie, for this. I know maybe I went a bit over time, but thank you. Thank you so much. I remember in those dark moments of telling you, you know, I love you as you are right now. <laughs> and whoever you become in the future. Yeah. So. And the last piece I want to share with this is this is a very good I'm very lucky for all of these things that have happened to me in your life, in my life. And, and people may hear these things and say, oh my gosh, that's so much, you know. But really, this is a fraction of what the majority of, of anyone who looks like me has experienced. And I'm lucky for to have the privilege of the support and access and, and things that I've had in my life, you know. So thank you, Raymond. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thank you for that sharing. It means a lot. And, and just, usually they're not the storytellers in my workshop, aren't my kids? So. <laughs> <laughs> it's a special experience. Um, so I just want to share this, this quote. This comes from a, a Indigenous youth intern, Victoria Morgan, Shukwetm Nichalmas. And um, again, I'm just going to read it out. So Link, just linking that collective story harvesting to self-discovery and awareness. So why is this important? Who are you representing? Where are you from? Acknowledge your past. Reflect on what has happened to bring us to where we are and where we want to go. Our history since colonization has been quite dark. And in many cases, in order to go forward, we have to acknowledge and reflect upon what happened to heal. Then we can go forward. All of us have to start changing personally for ourselves in order for things around us to change. Self-awareness shows respect and you offer the gift of your own awareness of your thoughts and your feelings and your background. And that connects us. I'm hearing lots of gratitude in the chat for your sharing. And, and we're gonna, I'm, I'm it's great to see people are, are already reacting and, and we're gonna share, we're gonna move to Menti again. So uh, just to really like to invite in, depending on the lens that you are listening with, um, if there were any ahas, any hmms that emerged while you were listening and just what did you notice? What did you see, hear, feel? And so it's if you'd like to go to menti.com and uh, type in that code. Well, it should just, if you've already done it once, then it will just kind of open. You won't have to enter the code, but if it's your first time, then, then yeah, you can type that in as well. You're open, welcome, more than welcome to use the chat. Oh, I did it as a word cloud. Interesting. I meant to do it as um, little boxes. Oh, well, that's okay. <laughs> so we're getting some understanding, cultural supports for safety. That's been so key. And that's some a common thread I hear throughout, uh, you know, is the importance of culture. And, and it definitely has been for me. Uh, learning, I learned about nonviolent communication, compassionate communication, and and calling this calling in culture through agreements and then learning more about our Inuit culture. And it's like, oh, look, we do the same thing, the way that we address conflict. Um, you know, someone did something the day before rather than, and we'd all come together and eat breakfast in the morning. So we'd share that morning meal together. And uh, if someone had done or said something in their day that was causing harm amongst the people rather than, uh, pointing them out uh the leader and our leader we don't have chiefs uh we just our leader was apparent through their words through their actions through their age you know if you've lived a long life you've made some good choices and then they would speak in that strength-based way rem reminding folks to be kind to be compassionate to be mindful acknowledge maybe we've been we're tired and we're hungry and we're going through a hard time and, and those pieces and it's that beautiful way of calling in. The least thing we'd want to do is to exclude someone, especially you know when we're living in such a harsh environment. So we've heard so here are some feedback so far. Heart is heavy, yeah. And you know, maybe let's just take a breath. 
let out some of that, those feelings or feelings. Good to acknowledge them. And then let them go. And, and you know, those feelings are they're that signal to be curious about ourselves. What can, without any blame or shame, learn more about ourselves? And, and those big feelings are that connection to shared humanity. Loving people through pain. So, so beautiful and so hard. I know that's something, you know, that I learned about from my Inuit culture. And I have these tattoos, which are the combs for our goddess of the sea. And they come with teachings of generosity, especially when you, at uh, times when it's the hardest, whether that's because you don't feel like you have much to give materially or emotionally and just still do that. Resilience, so people heard your resilience, Raven, um, the love, the strength in your story and compassion and courage, bravery, uh, the importance of safety, so important, yes, yeah. Understanding pain, yeah, so important, and especially because our brain tricks us about pain too, so mm -hmm. it's really important to, to take that time. How do we change? Yes, mm -hmm. yep, that's that power of repetition. And I think, you know, making that time at the beginning of meetings of any agreements we'd like to offer, it creates that strength-based way to create a calling in culture. It doesn't have to take forever. It could take two, five minutes. And I find it really helps to, to shift. Mm -hmm. My partner really likes Brene Brown and something Brene Brown talks a lot about is shame and connection and vulnerability. So they say shame dies in safe connection. And that takes that vulnerability that needs to talk about these things to share with others and, and to cultivate that safe openness for when others share with us. And checking in with that context is something that's really important as well is this at the right time to share is this the right time and do i have the capacity to receive you in a good way um that's that's part of that medicine right of that healing yeah thank you i hear it see here hopeful for our youth and definitely you know me too because yeah i was only in my 30s when i learned about our the truth of our shared history mm -hmm. And so grateful that, you know, my own children have learned this from a young age. So they have that more context, as is everyone in that growing awareness, especially since the first 200 and 215 uh, children, um, the, the truths will come to light and the many more children that, that will be uh, brought, brought home. Need to share stories. Yes, it's so important. Uh, you know, storytelling, it activates all kinds of parts of our brain. It's a really powerful ancestral way humans have passed on along knowledge across all the cultures. Mm -hmm. Feeling inspired, incredibly sorry. Yes, yeah, for sure. Definitely feel that as a mama. Yeah. Uh, and we hold that that love and that compassion for ourselves and others, right? That, that we're breaking down the idea of bad and good to allow for the full scope of our humanity and ourselves and each other. You know, again, with the, the language when we're shifting from, oh, I would never be like that. You know, I, I would never do those things. Well, you know, we all are human. We are all fallible. We make these mistakes. We do these things. And those are opportunities for for us to learn and to grow and to meet each other in diverse ways. That's been a big part of my learning journey uh, and big part of my learning journey around mental health and in the relationships that I've been in, especially with my latest, my, uh, with my partner River as well, is, is just this journey of that there's no bad or good. There's, we're all on this journey together and how can we be each other's allies in that, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody can be an ally for each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I love uh, so many comments and engagement here. Two spirit wisdom, uh, making time to listen, that slowing down. I know sometimes we can, you know, be in meetings like, okay, we got half an hour, let's go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, or, or we start to hear answer and then we're like, oh yeah, okay, I already know the answer and, uh, and kind of jump to the next piece. And um, yeah, we've got recognition of institutional racism and saw comments of, yeah, the need for new policies for, for um, 
for I think for first responders, for folks who are in crisis, people who are trained in trauma informed practice, you know, when we're in a triggered state, our cortisol levels are high. And so um, we'll perceive a neutral resting face as, as angry versus uh, if, you know, so often um, I'll try and <laughs> sorry, and I think my ancestors too are always smiling and humor and, and mm -hmm. our spirit is so important. Um, let's see, elevate indigenous voices. And I think I saw integrate indigenous in as well. And I think that's so important. You know, Albert Einstein uh, has this quote that we can't use uh, the same kind of thinking that got us into a problem to get us out. You know, Western uh, and colonization around the world, we have globalization and colonization has created this mess we're in. And so, uh, you know, the answers lay in the land, they lay in the indigenous nations and all that ancestral wisdom. When people first came to these lands here uh, at Megan, Beacon Hill, they just thought, oh, this magical, beautiful meadow place and oh, how inconvenient for these folks to be living here. We're gonna move them over. and. They didn't recognize because things weren't grown in in rows in a monoculture. They didn't recognize all of the uh, stewardship that was already happening here by Lekwungen nations. And um, and so you know uh, when they came when explorers came to these lands on Turtle Island, they just thought it was this land of plenty, and that was because of the stewardship of nations for thousands of generations. So so important that we can start to make space for indigenous people knowledge and practice I think it'll it'll really bring us along yeah a really important piece I remember learning through Alberta child and fa uh, Alberta family wellness program they have an early childhood brain development thing where they talk about the first five years of our prenatal and postnatal sets the foundation for our, our development as a human being and kind of in that how do we allocate funds and in, in, in um in government to support um uh young adults and youth later on and how much focus is centered in policy around that rather than in that prevention piece how are we supporting young parents how are we supporting access to funds access to the tools to all of these different things to to children to to the families to these things that kind of prevention piece that that prevention is cultivating that intentional relationship with ourselves community and the land in a holistic context rather than treating symptoms as they come up which is the more of the Western mindset and also a reflection of the, the Western agricultural as opposed to more indigenous uh, based permaculture. There's those, those delineations to draw there. Awesome, thank you so much. I love all the feedback that, that's been shared here. Um, it's just, it's really wonderful. I love that, you know, you are really <laughs> listening. <laughs> Thank you. I'm gonna I'm gonna move us on now and um, uh, just raise my hands to each and every one of you for your participation. And some of you might just be sitting back and watching, and that's okay too. Just being present and witnessing is is also doing the work. So grateful to each and every one of you here. Um, so I just, I wanted to share this slide because whenever I offer workshops, you know, some of the feedback I get is people want a checklist. Uh, they want to know what to do and what not to do, right? You know, we all want to do the right thing, that belief in good intentions, belief in the basic goodness of people. And so the Indigenous Relations Behavioral Competency, uh, building a trust-based relationship, it's broken down into uh, demonstrating behaviors when, the, the do's, and the needs developing when list, the don'ts. <laughs> and so if you're looking for that kind of checklist, what should I do, what should I not do, you know, to support uh, building relations um, with anybody really, uh, but re uh, here it's in that context, but I find these are great for just building relationships with any human. So those are, are available publicly. And I just like to, to share those for, with you. And then I just want to take a moment to linking that principle of it starts with me and the competency of self-discovery and, and awareness. 
yeah, you know, I, I that checklist I used to resist, you know, like we're not doing checklists, but then I'm like, okay, my namesake, Bunny Revelick, my new ballot name, she is a, a seamstress and she sewed for the explorer Valjmer Stephenson. And so my whole lineage is around bridging cultures. And so <laughs> over time, I'm like, okay, if, you, if, if the bridge out there is the checklist, then I'm going to meet them there, you know? And uh, so eventually I come around like, okay, let's give them the checklist. <laughs> if that's what helps, let's do it. So there it is. Uh, baby steps, right? And so, yeah, I just wanted to share a, a little bit too uh, on that journey of self-discovery and awareness. Again, you know, this sharing is without blame or shame. It's about learning our, our own behaviors, about learning about our blind spots and our biases. You know, we all have physical blind spots. I, I could have a little sticky note on my back. And unless somebody <laughs> tells me. Uh, <laughs> all right or I could have like this big thorn right like I've learned some social conditioning through movies um, to be fearful of indigenous people and it could be subconscious too and so I could have this big subconscious thorn sticking mm -hmm. out and every time I'm turning around with my good intentions and talking to people and causing harm because they haven't done the work mm -hmm. and so there's so many tools to help with that um, real engine r-e-e-l engine is a documentary that unpacks uh, all of the movies and how that influences uh, the way that we think and some of those unconscious things mm -hmm. that we can we can um, not be realizing that that we're carrying with us, and you know, even as an you know, colonization is not and residential schools is not only impacted and impact impacted me; it's impacted all of us. And so, learning about our shared history again, without that blame and shame, what are our blind spots and biases? For me, as a second generational residential school survivor, empathy is what is a blind spot. My dad to survive shuts down. When things are, are uncomfortable, um, he shuts down. You know, my mom's in pain on the couch and he's talking to me about sports. Um, and before I used to think, God, he's such not very nice guy. And then I'm like, oh, residential schools. Okay, that gives me that context to have compassion for him. And so for me, I've also uh, inherited that for some of those closest to me. And so I've had to ask for help, ask for help from my partner in those moments when I'm not being empathetic, just to give me that little nudge. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, wow, love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. Okay, coming from a place of love. And, and then some of that daily work, you know, this is like sharpening the saw. It's something we got to work at continuously. Some of the things I do every morning, I make time for uh, some grounding exercise, for some meditation, for some yoga, for some learning about either my Celtic or my Inuit ancestry, and just a way to really ground myself through through each day. And so I just wanted to share that a little bit more of that, that into integration. Oh yeah, I can see someone's checking out the do's and don'ts coming in with that. A do do is coming in without an agenda. <laughs> That's one of the biggest challenges. <laughs> Deep belly breaths when you do that, and and gratitude for us. You know, if you're the key thing is in in this work, it's uncomfortable. So if you're feeling comfy, maybe check in and see like, hmm, there could be some more work I'm doing because definitely this work is about leaning into the discomfort, leaning into the uncertainty, taking that leap of faith and making space for Indigenous people, knowledge and practice. So I just want to share some tools uh, to help integrate this into our lives. You know, now that we've learned what we've learned about Raven's story and anything else we've learned today, now that we know what we know, how do we bring this into our circles of influence, whether that is our homes, our community, our work? And I love the First Nations Health Authority. They have so many great tools out there. They have a policy, a policy statement on cultural safety and humility, which has been really helpful in giving me insight into program funding development. They also have this First Nations um, cultural safety and humility, key drivers and ideas for change. And so they have from both the self exercises to some team exercises around what are some things that you can do. 
you know, and if you're still on that early learning journey of doing territorial acknowledgements, that's okay. And if it's helpful at first to write something down and you read it out and, you know, you're feeling nervous and, and doing your best to pronunciate, I've heard elders say it's better to do your best to pronunciate uh, than just to not say anything at all. And then over time, as you start to feel more comfortable doing that acknowledgement, making it more personal, thinking about what are those acts of reconciliation, like Elder Mahara was talking about, you know, and that's a beautiful way to share in an acknowledgement or what are some of those acts of personal acts of reconciliation that you're doing to make those acknowledgements really meaningful. So lots of different ways that we can, uh, there's so many resources out there now for, for learning and growing. And, um, and as we wrap up, because I think we're going to have a little bit of time for Q&A possibly, and we're still going to do a checkout. I just like to talk a little, a gentle reminder, and I appreciate Avanti for uh, putting in the chat earlier the uh, QR code for, I'm not the QR code, the phone number for uh, the a family assistance program for counseling. Uh, you know, it's uh, something that I know within the provincial government that we pay for out of our paychecks. So making use of that and, and you can specify and ask it, you know, and see if it's possible. You know, if, if you're indigenous, say, you know, I'm looking for somebody who has that um, understanding of our shared history. Or if you're a two-spirit and you're looking for that support, say I'm two-spirit and I'm looking for support around that. So you can kind of narrow down people who, who might have that kind of skill set to support you. Mm -hmm. And you know, an important win I think we've learned through the pandemic, an important part of uh, um, uh, self-care is community care, right? So if we're feeling sick now these days, staying home is part of community care so that we don't spread sickness. And, and community care is also that, that self-care. Um, yeah. Um, oops. <laughs> Um, there's so many different ways that you can take care of yourself, you know, there's that's creating sacred space, uh, peacefulness, uh, I'm out on the land, I find that it's such an in a powerful place, especially to shift from the mindset of scarcity mindset, there's not enough to go outside and just feel like the force of nature, the force of life in nature and the abundance of it um, is, is quite wonderful. So, and sleep so important. Uh, I've been taking power naps and uh, also learned that that can help with uh, heart disease, which is great because that's prevalent in, uh, in my family. And then movement, like we did earlier. Mm -hmm. So, so many ways to, uh, for self-care, uh, and, you know, sometimes when it when we can be down, just even that reaching out and, and offering kindness to someone else can generate good feelings in someone else. And then it's kind of, I would tell you, so it's kind of like a little cheat, you know, if you're feeling down on yourself, do something kind for somebody else. It makes them happy, then, then their happiness will help bring, bring your happiness. Um, yeah, anything you want to add about the care? Mm -hmm. Routine's been a really big thing I've been learning from my partner. As a 22 year old, I'm very much been used to the like staying up late and eating sugary foods before bed and all these kinds of things and shifting in that place where kind of realizing through my partner as well that, oh my gosh, these things actually have impacts on our mental and physical health that can lead up and add up and create instability and, and lessen our emotional capacity that we can hold for ourselves and our others. And if we are to be honoring each other with presence with these things, it's about, we can cultivate that again, prevention with how we cultivate our routine. Um, so I know that's been something that's helpful for, for me and later on these days and still very much a learning practice uh, as a 22 year old. Yeah. And I saw a question, someone asked if we're blood relatives. So yes, yeah, Raven is my eldest. <laughs> I have one more who's 20 and uh, yeah. <laughs> And then as part of self-care, um, music and writing has been a part of Raven's self-care. And uh, I think Raven might have a little poem to share. 
Uh, so inviting in maybe a deep breath. Exhale. And uh, transitioning, yeah, to our, our listening ears and uh, invite Raven to share. So a trigger warning with this piece as well. Um, colonial violence, abuse, suicide, um, sexual abuse. Um, so if you know you are being triggered by any of those things, either you can turn off your sound for a couple minutes as I go through this, or um, or you can remember your grounding tools. You know, if you are triggered, um, please reach out to anyone. We're practicing that vulnerability, even though it's hard. It is that repetitive practice that that keeps us and others safe. When I was a child, what was done to me was forgivable given the context. We begin to understand the actions of another in the eyes of the hurt. Taken from the land where the children that became men, taken from the land where the children that became women, taken from the land where the children that became hidden, these roles were once played in accordance to the dance of life. Insert violence, repression and oppression, abuse, rape, power structures outside of the law of nature, extraction and mutilation. Men become vultures, virtuous in their innocence of only knowing the world created by and for them at the expense of blood and grief. And still a child will unwind the hurt. There's so many rituals of pain that take a thousand tales and a thousand lives to bring out the shadow, hide and hurt with knives and pens, drunk and dry the lot and lens, steal a car and then be done out all night to see the sun. Find your way back home through the grief to the semblance of a memory of who you know you are, who those that came before know you to be. That is to say, when I was a child, what was done to me was forgivable, given the context. 22 years have passed, and I can understand why I tried to take my life seven times. 22 years have passed, and I can understand why my parents hurt the way they did. 22 years have passed, and I can understand why the hurt and not blame myself and others. 22 years have passed, and I can see how much I still have to learn. What was done to me was a fraction of what my most recent relatives and ancestors experienced. Any and all of the brown skinned descendants understand in their body the recent shock and horror of laboratory dissections of our grandmothers, the coming home to missing children, the stolen tongue and woven lives. 22 years have passed and I can understand why someone who looks like me is passed out on the sidewalk overdosed what had to have happened to be the roadmap that brought them there. Our many decades sober uncle having a stroke and being passed off as fire water less than brain dead by the time any would sense his spirit already leaving. 12 years old, my friend hangs herself off the swing set in her backyard. Brown girl taken by foreign hands, cruel and colonized, play to pay. When I was a child, what was done to me was forgivable given the context. We pay for our skins and you can get paid for yours and we understand that love is the only way. Love is the only true answer. And what does love mean if not justice and true peace? I see you take such deep care in the unfolding of your pain so as not to stir the earth below but craft the sharp ribbons of twisted steel into paper thin birch bark tools to rejoin the game of the forest. Necessary co-creative love, inherent belonging to the cyclical and natural order of all things. Our needs met, our wants, a diverse dance of joy and pain. Access to the supports we need, access to our breath and the guided knowledge for how to use it. Access to the entitlement of life in a world that shames our happiness and shuns our pain. Access to the humanity of a curious and compassionate gaze, justice, peace love saves lives and you can still save so many if you remember deep inside yourself the curiosity and compassion of your own family beyond its grief and take this love turned into a thousand documents as the lantern carried forward through time and space turned into presence and belonging thank you Thank you, Raven. Just have that moment of silence to, to honor you. 
Thank you. So many ways to practice self-care. Wonderful. And again, so just that gentle reminder about supports that are available to, to many of you. And then there's other supports as well, the Indian Residential School Survivor Society and uh, Healing in Color is a wonderful page that has uh, counselors for Black, Indigenous, people of color. Ah, you're getting lots of kudos and warm gratitude and, and love for your poem there in, in the um, chat. Right and I just want to stay say along those lines and thank you all for your responses as well as that one of the teachings that I know we have is stepping away from the individualistic world that is the Western paradigm to that of understanding that everything that I am is only my friends, my family, my relatives, and my partner in the last year shaped a lot of who I am. And a lot of what I share comes from the words and the ideas and the beliefs and the actions of those around me. And so I just want to say thank you to everyone in my life and my mother here and my sister, my partner, all these people. When I share, I share who they are as well. You know, we give that credit. It's not just I, it is always a we. So, Wonderful. So. Thank you. I just want to acknowledge, you know, people are sharing tears and, and share that elders have taught me that tears are medicine, they're healing. And as well, uh, when we release tears, we release stress hormones. So if you've been feeling any stress, it's a really good way to release stress, to have a little cry. It's really good. And, you know, we, we want to do a checkout. I love doing a checkout just to see how things are landing. Uh, and my favorite way kind of check out is the invitation to share something you're leaving behind and something you're taking away. We'll see if what I, if I did a word cloud or bubbles today, but um, I'm curious, Raven, uh, if you'd like to share anything you're leaving behind and anything you're taking away. Something I know I'm taking away is hope hope for the, the recognition of humanity in all of us for ourselves and each other, you know, for, to, to see and be seen, uh, to hear and be heard is really the pathway, pathway forward. That, that, that love is always that answer, that compassion and curiosity are, are those pathways forward. Um, yeah, so I, I think that's something I'm, I'm reminded of, and I'm just grateful to to our elders and to our hosts here for for holding this, this very very special space to to share, and uh, and for all of the speakers who'll come next to us. That's something I'm grateful for. You know, we say the next seven generations. In this case, it's the next seven minutes or seven hours. <laughs> We're thinking of who is coming next. So. I see that and, and I ask you the same question. Is there anything you're you're taking with you or is there anything you're leaving behind? I'm leaving behind deep gratitude for your your being here and sharing and uh, gratitude for each of your uh, presence here today. I'm taking away a sense of hopefulness. You know, that the more people who make that journey from their head to their heart. Uh, and then and then step into that courageous say, space to do or say something, you know, to make space for Indigenous people knowledge and practice. It really gives me hope. And I see lots of other people are feeling hope and gratitude and love and understanding, uh, leaving behind prejudice, uh, leaving behind making mistakes. You know, it's... Uh, um, it's how we learn and grow from our youngest age. And uh, I, I'm a believer in the responsibility process rather than apologies. So I'd much rather receive an acknowledgement of, oh, I, I, I made a mistake or I caused some harm. And here are three things I'm going to do to make sure that I don't do that again. One of them <laughs> is sharing this with you, yeah, totally. yeah. <laughs> which takes a lot of courage yeah. to face someone and say, like, I'm, you know, I, I caused harm. Okay. It, it wasn't intentional. Mm -hmm. I was in in my own place of hurt. Here, are, here's three things I'm going to do. I'm going to, when I have big feelings and it's something I do do, I have a little personal time out. And I just go lie on my bed and I, till I can ground myself and think about what is it that, how do I want to be? How do I want to see? 
And um, yeah, so we've got that shame dies in safe connection. That's know. true. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Motivation to change. Nice. Taking no blame, no shame. Yes. Yeah, so good. You know, I think it's and it's somewhere our brains just go to because that's how we're conditioned. So I think that naming it and making that space to let go of it, leaving anger, leaving guilt. Yeah. Leave all that stuff behind. You know, they're, they're good to acknowledge because they're signals of our shared humanity and some of that work. And then also to let it go, to leave it behind so that we can move forward, leaving ignorance, leaving shame. Wonderful. Feeling inspired, leaving fear. Yeah, fear is such a big one. And as it rises up, it's important to acknowledge, say, hey, I see you. I'm going to be curious and then I'm going to let you go because that's not, you're not going to serve me beyond that. Elevating Indigenous folks. Yes. Mm -hmm. Being brave. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Feeling honored. Beautiful. Respect. Leaving obliviousness. Wonderful. Taking connectedness. Leaving unintended harm. Yeah, you know, a, a lot of times it's unintentional. And, and uh, the more that we can especially take in that kind of gender-based analysis, indigenous gender-based analysis, plus kind of making sure we're privileging all the voices of the communities that we represent will reduce the amount of unintended harm. Strength, courage to change, Wonderful. Try take chances. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I know I've had people tell me like, oh yeah, you know, I wanted to do territorial acknowledgement, Stephanie, but you were in the room. So I didn't I'm like, okay, next time go for it. I'll be your personal cheerleader. Or they'll say, yeah, I was in that conference on diversity and didn't see any diversity in the panel. And you, you put up your hand and said something and like, uh, yep, I sure did. And the, the value of having somebody non-Indigenous when I've done that, and then like a, a non-Indigenous male who then puts up their hand, you know, and they're like, what's your name? I'm like, oh, Stephanie. They're like, I support everything Stephanie said. And here's my own two senses why. And, you know, to have that validation by mm. people in a dominant culture and then in their own words, just because of the way our brains work with stereotyping, you know, sometimes people not might not hear what I'm saying or what Raven's saying, but they'll hear it from someone in, in that looks and sounds like them. So, mm. you know, you're, your role in allyship is so important in, in um, that echoing, validating in your own words um, is, is what makes the difference uh, because it takes all of us, right? There's space in this work for each and every one of us. And that's why I love Circle. Circle is something um, that is inclusive to cultures all around the world. So I know sometimes people are worried about appropriating and it's an, anc an ancestral inherent right for each and every one of us. And I love Circle because there is always room for each and every one of us in, in a circle in all of our roles. We've got heart wide open and trust, transparency. These are off. Oh, so wonderful, you know, just so grateful for the wisdom in this room, that shared leadership. Uh, when we when we're in that space where we can feel safe and we're in that part of prefrontal cortex part of our brain, the, the wisdom that is there is remarkable. Mm -hmm. Yes, being allies and accomplices. And you know, mm -hmm. I think courage, yeah. Yeah. And uh one of the accomplices I just love uh in, in this past year or so uh alongside Jody Wilson Raybould was minister, former minister Jane Philpot, you know, she really put her skin in the game. Uh, and uh, and I think that's what's really needed. It's so easy to kind of walk away. And so when we put our skin in the game and become a part of that, it, it really helps to make a difference. Wow, I love all of the feedback. Rebelling against injustice. Yeah. Donate to indigenous organizations. <laughs> yeah. Nice, that's a good one. Donate money and time, common humanity, connectedness, we're one. 
lifelong ongoing journey that's such an important one you know we're never arriving at a place of good you know to this day it's still we're still struggling we're still human all this idea of like look at these people and they're so they've made it here and they're everything and so now they have something to share from their arrival but it's really that we're all still on this journey and we're meeting each other where we're at and that you know my mom likes to use the term like shared leadership and I, I really believe in that you know Awesome. Thank you all so much. Our, our last slide is, is gratitude and in particular, uh, raise my hands up to the organizers of this conference, uh, making space for, for this time to be able to share with you. Uh, gratitude to each and every one of you for your participation, for your open hearts, your open listening, your hearts and minds, and as well that courage to move into that uh, brave space and, and making space for Indigenous people, knowledge and practice. And so excited that Pixic is going to be playing after us. I actually, uh, when I lived in Yellowknife, um, New Tiffany, as, as a very young girl, so uh, wonderful to see uh, her grown up and, to, and her sister to be such powerful uh, in, in uh, women and to be sharing our Inuit culture um, and to be sharing in the same space with people. So uh, yeah, just raise my hands to each and every one of you and wishing you all the best. And I think that leaves us with a few minutes um, to transition. So great. Koyanak and Masicho and as uh, Tom King said, stay strong, be brave and watch for the signs. <laughs> I like to end my sessions too with an alligator clap. Oh yeah. Maybe Tristan remembers. <laughs> so we put one hand out for our energy and our attentions, another hand up into the universe, the energy from there, and then coming together. There we go. Close the energy of our circle. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephanie and Raven. Must you Cho. I'm so grateful to have your wonderful energy this morning, your kindness and your compassion has really shone through in your discussion and your vulnerability. Um, sharing our stories and sharing our tears and sharing our space in this way takes a lot of strength and it really demonstrates our resilience. So for that, I have a lot of gratitude. The gratitude is something that I am going to leave this session with. And something that I'm going to take away from the session is a new perspective and understanding. Stephanie, you opened the day by sharing an opportunity for everyone in attendance to um, set our intentions collectively for this session. And not only for the session, but for our day as a whole. I'd like to share that one of my daily intentions is to begin each and every day with gratitude. For folks who have been in our physical space before, you'll notice that I have it scrawled on the whiteboard next to my desk. So one of the circle agreements that I really enjoy is to give what you can and to take what you need. Stephanie mentioned circle way earlier in the presentation. And the reason why this particular agreement really resonates with me is because each and every day we are going to bring a different version of ourselves to the table. So giving what you can is really acknowledging where you are at and what space you are joining from in that day and doing your best to give as much as you can in that time. Um, Stephanie and Raven, if you're comfortable, I do have a couple of questions that I'd like to share with you. So first off, the question is for Raven. You speak so extremely well at a young age. What was the major change for you? Or how did you overcome the historic trauma? And your story is so moving. Beautiful. Thank you for the question. Um, it's often not what people would expect for me to move through a lot of the grief and pain. I had to go through some pretty serious addictions. I had to move through some very expressive and often scary ways of getting the grief out, getting the pain out. You know, we are often so mobilized or numb from 
all of the things we hold inside of ourselves that we may, might not even be aware of. We might have normalized these ways. And so finding those ways, being supported in those harm reductionist ways to, to explore and to express grief, rage, anger, all of these different human emotions and to be have that received uh, in, in safety and support either by a relationship with land, relationship with culture, ceremony, family, relationships, all of these different things, you know, held in that understanding, held in that love. Um, that's that's been really really fundamental and just provides that base work you know and that's just even getting back to a to a normal to the to the to the baseline where we go from there you know it still depends on on how those relationships are cultivated how we're supported and what it is we want to do with that you know and having that space to, to support whatever our youth's dreams are is, is really, really important. And any anyone, whatever their dreams are, how can we support them? How can we not shame them for their struggles, you know, with mental health, with disability, with different, all these different pieces, you know, but just continue to uplift and, and support everyone, no matter who they are, you know. I, I might also add that Raymond comes from a, on both sides of the family from people with public speaking <laughs> and politicians. So <laughs> might come by it that way too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So I do have one more question. And during the presentation, you talked about language use. Do you have examples on how to welcome an Indigenous, Métis, or Inuit person respectfully in a hospital or healthcare setting? I'll give you both a few moments to think of how you would like to answer that, or if you would like to answer that at this time. Uh, one of the things that both Stephanie and Raven have really taken the time to reiterate throughout their presentation is the importance of respecting that space for silence. Silence is so powerful and sometimes taking a moment to just pause and collect ourselves and to take a nice deep breath can really make a world of difference. So with that being said, maybe we'll all take a nice big inhale and exhale. And I'll pass the floor over to you both. I think for me as a mom, um, I think at, you know, when in that kind of first process of, of checking in in the hospital, and I think it's important to share that there's resources available to Indigenous people, whether that's the Indigenous liaison, uh, and I've appreciated when there's like the little pamphlet there, and, um, and just sharing that, you know, that's available for, for First Nations, for Métis, and for Inuit. And just kind of letting folks know in, in case they, uh, um, you know, would like those extra supports. And I know one time when I, I was before I had all my visible tattoos, so people used to think I was Asian. And, um, you know, I went to grab the pamphlet and someone said, oh, those are for just Indigenous people. And so, and, you know, and my, my youngest, who you haven't seen yet, but uh, she, she's uh, red head and green eyes and and pale skin so you know and she's Dene Métis and Inuit so you know uh, uh, just being mindful to never make assumptions about about people who are asking for those resources they might not look how you expect and yet they may very well still be um, so that's I think what, what I have to share is that kind of inviting in language um, I don't know what you're yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Stephanie. That's really big. Um, <clears throat> something I know that's that's I've heard from, you know, a lot of my Indigenous kin is how we have to dress up, put on your Sunday clothes, even to go into the hospital, even if you're in crisis, you, we still have to dress up to go into the hospital. We know we'll be treated better, received better if we're, if we're dressed up like that. And I think a big piece of that for, you know, if I could say anything, the hospital administration and say, trust us. You know, if we say something is, is happening for us in our bodies or something's going on, trust us, we need, we need people to believe in us, you know, and believe what we're saying. You know, we're not, there's a lot of stereotypes where we're trying to get medication or trying to get drugs or trying to get these things and, or, or even the stereotypes, we have a higher pain tolerance, you know, and we kind of, 
take all that away and just say exactly in the comments day, hi, how can I help you today? And follow that up with, okay, this is what you said you need help with? Perfect, we'll help you that way, you know, that we know ourselves best. Each of us is our own expert, you know, and, and, and so okay. uh, something that comes up for me is how uh, it kind of in the upcoming New Age spirituality, we're talking about intuition and how do we differ from our unconscious biases from our intuition you know if i feel fear immediately rise and i see someone who's brown and and that fear comes up is that my intuition or is that my social coding is that is that a narrative that's been fed to me by media you know and so kind of being in relationship with ourselves and our bodies enough to know the language of emotions the language of our body and to take those things a step back take a breath you know Thank you. And I, I like the comment. Yeah, having symbols, you know, um, like so on that pamphlet, it might just be having FNHA on it. I'm not sure, but having symbols for a Metis Nation, having a symbol for Inuit to that, then that's that little signal, right, of like, okay, this is for me as well, um, is, is another way too. So I, I like that idea of, of symbols and, and having that. Yeah. I think you've made a friend right in there oh, <laughs> in the comments. <laughs> so wonderful. I really appreciate all of your kindness to my eldest. It means a lot. <laughs> uh, what about the medicine wheel symbol? Ooh, that's a good question. You know, I think that that shows the colors of, in my understanding, is the teachings that has the colors of all the people in the world. So it, it's it's inclusive. Um, and, and maybe that's something that not everyone might know though. So having those extra, maybe a little Anukshik or a little Métis symbol as well or something like that. Um, one of my orange t-shirts has has a, has the feather and the Métis symbol and the, and the Anukshik and that kind of, you know, shows that inclusivity. Mm -hmm. And that reminds me of one of the words that you mentioned earlier on in your presentation. And that was not in that one heart, one mind. Um, here at Aboriginal Health and at Vancouver Coastal Health, we do have an annual event, which is aimed at honoring the community of women within our Vancouver Community Center. And that's an opportunity for our office to connect with the folks who are living in these spaces and to acknowledge them, to take the opportunity to listen to them, and to, of course, celebrate with them and alongside them. Another word that was not spoken, but that some of our Vancouver Coastal Health employees may be familiar with is pesca, which means hummingbird. I heard um, Stephanie share a story about the hummingbird. So for folks who have been interacting with our content, you'll notice that uh, we have a lot of offerings with the word pesca, because for us, it's a starting point. It's just the beginning of your journey. Maybe you're coming to us without a lot of knowledge and that's okay. It's just acknowledging that we have it within each and every one of us to take that time and set that space aside for this personal development and this opportunity to acknowledge where we might need a little bit of work and to acknowledge that um, our learnings and our teachings may change over time. And, that's okay. That's all part of the process. So with that being said, again, I'm so grateful to both of you for sharing space with us. And perhaps now the three of us can do that alligator class that you were talking about. You folks, if you'd like to join in, I welcome you to. It's all part of the fun. All right. Three, two, one. Excellent. So I'm going to pass the screen over to Avanti. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much, Tristan. And I'd like to also um, share my gratitude to Stephanie and Raven Papik for a very moving um, session. I was just reflecting myself and thinking about what Raven shared about being in relationship with ourselves and about our social coding. You know, when you work in the area of cultural safety, I think for myself, I sometimes think that, you know, implicit bias doesn't affect me, but but it does. And it also 
um, impacts the way in which we work. So I'm going to be thinking about that and also thinking about the way in which I approach my work. Um, and I, I should have uh, provided an introduction to myself. So um, my name is Avanti and I am the ICS coordinator here at Aboriginal Health. I go by the pronouns she, her, and I am a second generation settler whose uh, parents migrated from what we know today as Bangladesh. So it is my great uh, um, privilege and honor to be able to introduce um, our next session, which is a pre-recorded performance by the singing duo Pilk Silk. Pilk Silk is a word in Inuktitut, which means a natural phenomenon, a windstorm that conjures the impression of snow falling back up towards the sky. And these sisters, Tiffany Eilick and Inukshuk McKay, um, they grew up and spent a lot of time on the land in Yellowknife. And I recall that um, Raven and Stephanie were talking about the connection to land. And so this really um, influenced sisters Tiffany and Inukshuk when they started to think about their culture and with respect to throat singing, this is a cultural practice that was almost lost. It was endangered due to colonial systems and racism. And so our performers have shared that throat singing is unique to the Inuit in North America. As Tiffany and Anukshuk approach adulthood, they realized throat singing was not only a musical expression, but it is a radical political act of cultural revitalization. The songs that they share and perform are completely improvised. And with that, I will share the performance that they have for us today. A moment, please. Um, hi, 
That was hauntingly beautiful. Thank you so much to Tiffany and and Inuk Suk of um, who comprise of Tilt Silk. Um, so just before we wrap up before lunch, I would just like to once again thank Elder Mahara, Elder Dennis for his song. Um, I want to um, also send my gratitude and heartfelt thanks to Stephanie and Raven Papik for sharing their wisdoms, their vulnerability, and also for um, allowing all of us to think a little bit more about how we approach our practice. And finally, a thank you to Tristan for hosting this morning and to Leslie for um, helping start our day. Um, this afternoon, following lunch, we are going to be um, we are going to have our first keynote featuring the journalist and uh, Globe and Mail op-ed columnist, Tanya Talaga, who is also the author of Seven Fallen Feathers. That session is going to be hosted by our vice president, Leslie Bonshore at 1 p.m. And so for now, we'd like to um, invite folks to take a moment of reflection if you need to stretch your legs and obviously take that time for nourishment. And we hope to see you all back here at, at 1 p.m. Thanks so much. <laughs>